Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for June the 11th, 2020. This is episode number 11. Today, among other things, we'll be talking about the Tesla Cybertruck making its public debut. The Volkswagen ID4 has been accidentally revealed, and the model Tesla Model S has achieved 402 miles of EPA range. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and the Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Logney, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Outer Spec motoring and one lap youtube channels and he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new inside evs youtube channel go subscribe and tap that notifications bell so we are not streaming live on youtube for this episode i'm sorry we're still trying to work that out so you can leave comments and questions on today's show on the inside evs podcast post or the youtube comment section or even on the uh, Inside EVs forum podcast thread, where we have every episode available for your enjoyment. So, gentlemen, welcome. And we have lots to talk about today. But uh, before we get into the big news, let's see, uh, what do we have charging up in our driveways today? Uh, I believe last week we had a, a virtual situation with you, Kyle. And this week you have a little bit of other news from that for us. Yeah, virtual situation. I like that. Well, um, you know, we spoke last week a little bit about going to Ford's Performance Technical Center in Concord, North Carolina, hard of NASCAR country, where we were able to drive the Mustang Mach E virtually, which was kind of interesting because, you know, Ford's like, hey, come and be the first people to drive this car. And it was virtual. And so, you know, of course, we approached it with some like, is this going to feel real? But no, it was mind blowing how accurate and realistic the simulator was um, live now as of yesterday at the time of this recording uh, on MotorOne.com. It's right in the front page header if you're catching this soon is the uh, virtual first drive of the Mustang Mach-E. And you can see all of our thoughts that you know I put together on the driving impressions, the simulator. We'll have more rolling out from them. But we've had a lot of Mustang Mach-E news recently. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a really cool car based on all my impressions so far. So I'm pretty hyped about it. Um, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say this. So this, this morning, there was a little bit of Mustang... Uh uh, Maki news. And was that part of your, your show about the right, range so predictions? We actually didn't talk about it during my time there. We spoke a lot about the Copilot 360 stuff uh, that was announced yesterday, I guess. Um, right yesterday, 6 a.m., the embargo lifted on that. The Copilot 360 is Ford's essentially competitor to Autopilot or GM Super Cruise, which is uh, hands-off, and they advertise this as hands-off and driver monitoring done with a camera. Uh, and it uses the infrared spectrum, and there's multiple cameras if you're blocking the wheel. It's a great idea. Um, we'll see how well it works in practice, but I'm actually testing their earlier version of the system in the Ford Escape hybrid this week. It's not the plug-in one. It's pretty much the same car, but without the plug-in stuff. So I think it's going to be pretty good. Um, but their lane centering is insane in this. So Ford's really doing a lot with driver assistance tech. And uh, I'm excited to see what this Copilot 360 uh, plus with the prep package, all the cool things will be like in the real world. And they're launching it only for Mustang Mach-E to start. Obviously, it'll make its way to other products, but just for their electric car, that's pretty cool. Sure, elevates the electric car right up there. There, that's a one offering, all electric offering at the moment. So it's kind of weird. I find that they're they're advertising the the hands off part of it after you know, or Tesla drivers and, and Tesla itself gets criticized so much for you know using autopilot without your hands on the wheel. Like it's, it's a big deal. Your hands on the wheel. It's like constant yeah. messaging. Well, so, the the reason you can't do that in a Tesla is because the only human machine interface, HMI, from the from the user to the Tesla, the only way for the Tesla to know what the user is doing is by a little torque sensor and a steering wheel. And for users who are not always concerned about their personal safety, this is great because it allows you to do whatever you want while you're driving. You can text, you can fall asleep, you can, and all you little need is like a, you know, something on the steering wheel that's causing torque 
to tell it that you're paying attention, which I think is really insanely dangerous. Uh, what this system is doing is it's monitoring, monitoring the driver with visuals. And this is something that's needed across you know, the entire uh, uh, ADAS systems going forward. I, I think torque sensors need to go away. The cars need to know where what the driver is doing. Um, because think about how many Tesla owners we see with little weights over the steering wheel. And, you know, all it takes is for the system to mess up once. And I'm not knocking it. Autopilot's amazing, but you need driver monitoring with visuals. So Ford is cracked to that. Um, and same with Super Cruise. I mean, this isn't unique technology. I just think they're implementing it in a way that will be much better. There's a huge focus on knowing what state the car will be in at any given time. So you'll have little uh, graphics on the screen that look like this. You'll see it right there on the screen on the YouTube. And essentially it shows hands off the steering wheel. I got it. And this requires the roads to be pre-mapped. They'll have 100,000 miles in US and Canada of highways mapped. So pretty much any major highway. And they'll go around constantly improving that. Um, you know, the rebuttal to the pre-mapping HD mapping thing is, well, autopilot's taking every single situation as a brand new one with prior knowledge. I think that may make sense for a scalable approach. But when we're talking just about functionality with today's technology that you'll be able to experience in the next few years, I'm fine with this pre-mapping thing. Uh, and I'll make one last point about it because I know I'm going on. But um, over the air updates to the system to improve its functionality over time uh, will be key. As of now, I think the Mustang Mach-E, again, it hasn't hit start of production, but it is the only car other than Tesla that's capable of over the air updating every single module. Right, because in a, in a vehicle you have, you know, your infotainment, you have your controller, your motor controls, there's a whole bunch of different systems going on and Tesla can update any of those systems, but it's because of the way they're engineered, traditional automakers haven't been able to do that. They can update like the telematics. Yeah. But, a lot uh, of it's just for security purposes as well. Sure. I mean, try convincing a German brand to like saying you can now come in, you know, and, and mess everything up through software and hacking stuff. I mean, that's really tough for them. Um, but we'll see a trend going towards this. Uh, you know, I, I imagine Lucid, for example, will have this type of functionality and others going forward. So, um, you know, we'll see. I think Neo actually has a lot of over the air update capability. So I could be wrong. I, Neo might have the same functionality. Right. Well, Tom, you know a bit about Neo. Uh, do you know anything about how the other uh, ADAS yeah. system works? Yeah, you know, I don't know to what extent, actually, that they can, um, you know, what the over-the-air updates can manipulate. I know it can, you know, it's a smart system, and it definitely can, um, you know, change key modules. But I don't know if it goes as deep as what Tesla does right now and what Ford is going to be doing. Um, but that's it's it's good that this was brought up. Next time I chat with the Neo folks, I'm going to ask them, and um, I'll know for the next time. So while we have you on camera, there, what uh, what were you driving this week? I believe you had the Kona Electric still. Yeah, it's like Hyundai week for me. I had the uh, uh, Kona EV actually for a week, and the day before they were coming to pick it up, I got an email that said, "Hey, do you want a new 2020 Ionic? We just got them in." So, um, yeah, of course. And uh, that's what I actually have right now. And doing some uh, 70 mile an hour highway range tests and also recording uh, the charging uh, curves on both the vehicles. So uh, I should have some a bunch of Hyundai posts up on inside EVs. Uh, I'm not going to reveal too much, only that I guess, you know, Hyundais are extremely efficient vehicles. I mean, other than Tesla, Hyundai's the only other manufacturer that has seemed to really crack this efficiency code, and both cars are extremely efficient. I got really close to the EPA range rating on the Kona in my 70 mile an hour highway range test, which is fantastic. If you can drive 70 miles an hour, nearly get the EPA range rating. But the, the one thing I will say is the Ionic beat the EPA range rating driving at a constant 70 miles an hour. Wow. Which just like, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm recording myself as I'm driving it, you know, for the videos. And I'm like saying, I can't believe that I'm, this is going to happen, but it looks like it's going to happen. So um, that was pretty amazing. I averaged 4.5 miles per kilowatt hour at 70 miles an hour. Um, incredibly efficient vehicle. And, uh, you know, Hyundai's to be committed 
commended on that. Uh, you know, it's, you know, we're knocking the German manufacturers, Audi and Porsche about, you know, the efficiencies of the vehicles. And, uh, you know, uh, Tesla seemed to be the only one that was really putting such an enormous emphasis on it. But no, Hyundai's been, and, and Kia to, to a lesser extent, I think also, um, but Hyundai's really done something here with it. it it's an incredibly efficient vehicle. I think people are going to really like this vehicle when they get it. Just um, just uh, remind us on your you did uh, your Model Three uh, test a couple of weeks ago. Was that four point two five miles per kilowatt hour? Exactly, Martin. Four point two five miles per kilowatt hour. Okay. I went two hundred ninety miles at seventy yeah. miles an hour. You know, you can't you. You can't knock that. I mean, it was EPA range rated when I got it at 310 miles. And, yeah. uh, you know, I only came up 20 miles short of the EPA range rating. And, yeah. you know, I was gushing all over Tesla when I when I did that in my video and, you know, proclaim, proclaiming them to be, you know, the efficiency kings. And <laughs> I've got to come back a couple of weeks later now and kind of eat a little crow <laughs> and say, wait a minute, you know, Hyundai, <laughs> Hyundai's yeah. got something going on here, too, because this car is incredibly efficient. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to getting behind the wheel of the Ionic Electric. I'm supposed to get one soon as well. I I wonder if it's the same one you have, but um, they seem to be pretty cool. Have you noticed any issues with the air cooled battery? Because it's it is it has a fan like the old Souls did, but there's no liquid thermal management, right? So yeah, I, um, the one thing that I have noticed about the fact the battery management is that Hyundai has dramatically slowed down the DC fast charge rate, which is super unfortunate. The Hyundai Kona mm -hmm. EV can charge at up to, um, well, the, the specs say 77 kilowatts, but I don't think many owners have ever reported more than 75 kilowatt. But I've only ever that, seen 76, yeah. Yeah, that, that's splitting hairs. Um, but the, the Ionic uh, is, is under 50 kilowatts. I, I don't know exactly what the maximum is yet, I only did, I did two quick DC fast charge sessions. I didn't do the full um, zero to 80% recording like I'm going to do today, actually right after this. But the crazy thing is I maxed out at 23 kilowatts on 150 kilowatt DC fast charger twice. Um, and uh, like I said, I didn't do the full session, but I charged up to like 35%, I think. And I didn't see more than 23 kilowatts. So it's, it it's, you know, where it's it's a it's a highly efficient car, but it's not a road trip car. It, it the DC fast charge rate is terrible. I can't wait to get out there a little later today and record the whole session and see exactly what it's. But I think it's going to take, you know, over an hour to get to eighty percent, and it's only a thirty-eight kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, that almost we'll kills all the benefits of that efficiency right there because you just yeah. can't use it on a trip. So, you know, yeah, you're yeah. just driving around town now. I mean, yeah. I know a guy, Chris Maxwell here in North Carolina that has an Ionic electric and like drives it everywhere. And he, I, I, you know, every post it's, Oh, I'm at this charger, this charger. I'm like, well, I would have been four past those chargers mm -hmm. and charging at 200 kilowatt you know, or 250 at a version three. And it's just, there's this huge disparity between like some manufacturers are doing things so well, like efficiency with Hyundai and others are like even a Porsche Taycan, terrible efficiency, but they have the charging figured out. So we need some sort of this middle of the road balance between the two. Yeah, you, you, you almost just assume that everything is a forward march in terms of progress. And in the new Ionic, the uh, AV system, the, the display is way better. You can now do a split screen display. Uh, the inside of the car, is so much better than that original one. But if you want to do fast charging, you're better off buying a three-year-old used one that's could just come off lease than buying a brand new one. At least it'll be like for like. You'll still do the same distance because it will charge a lot quicker. So we always think that EVs are, there's that relentless march of progress forwards. But it, and it's always a bit weird when they release a new model and actually it charge, it, the, the charging characteristics are worse than the one it replaced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was super surprised when I plugged in and was just, you know, I walked away for like 20 minutes and came back figuring I could head home. This was after doing the, uh, the, the full drive to zero range test. And I was like at like 18%. I was like, what's going on here? You know, did it, did it shut off? You know? Yeah. Um, and then I, I was watching it in like in amazement and I'm like, I, I I can't believe it. I wanted to actually record that session, yeah. but some of the early Electrify America charging stations have terrible screens. Mm. You can't record it. You can't even see it if you like 
put your face against the screen. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it was a, a wasted opportunity. I had the card down to zero. It was perfect to do it. But um, I'm going to head out today and uh, do that right after the podcast. Right on. We'll be looking forward to seeing the results of that. So we have to keep the show pretty tight today. Uh, Martin has lots of podcasting things to do. So let's move on to the stories and uh, see Such the an big thing. Man. Yeah. Uh, the big thing this morning is the Tesla Cybertruck is going to make its public debut in Los Angeles. So June 20 to 27th, that is soon. Uh, that's tomorrow, starting tomorrow for the week. Um, at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, it'll be on display in the lobby. And, you know, if you have a reserve, if you're one of the 700,000 or whatever people that has a, a reservation, you have it, you can now actually go and see it in the metal, literally in the metal, and, mm. uh, see, you know, get a feel of what it looks like. We've seen lots of pictures and videos, but there's nothing like standing in front of a, something to really give you, you know, a good impression of. You know, do I want to drive this? Do I want to be seen driving this? The, t the cyber truck styling is, you know, as you know, a little way out there. But uh, yeah, and while you're there, sorry, go ahead, Dominic. Go ahead. I apologize. No, oh, okay. I was just going to say, uh, while you're there too, don't just stop in the lobby. You can go up to the second floor, and there's an alter alternating currents exhibit, and they also have the uh, Model S prototype and a Roadster on uh, display there. So they have, I believe, two roadsters and there's another, there's a secret part of the Peterson called the vault. It's uh -huh. underneath. You basically, you go in, you have to pay, I forget what it was, but it's worth any amount of money. And you go downstairs real deep and they have a room. You're not allowed to take any photography, nothing like this, stuffed full of cars. I was just there not long ago. You have wow. to go. That's and amazing. It is the most amazing cars electric, not electric, you know, they have, you know, 30, $40 million cars down there all the way from movie cars, like Saddam Hussein's limo, just like weird stuff. <laughs> and, um, and it's just the most amazing experience. So go to the Peterson. They have plenty of EV charging. They have DC fast chargers in the parking lot. You go in the vault and you just spend as much time as you can soaking in every single car. I would go and see this if it was near me. And I would, uh, at, at the drop of a hat, go and see the Cybertruck if it was local to me or a short journey away uh, on display. Like, we know that when it makes a public debut, whether it's out filming with Leno or doing something, there's so many videos on Instagram and Twitter just from people following it being, oh, my goodness, look at this. It's so striking. And now I only heard the news yesterday that they're putting it on display for a week there. There are going to be queues round the block. And obviously in this kind of period where... A lot of public buildings are having to keep people further apart and social distancing. That's going to make the queues even longer because they can't just fling the doors open and welcome the masses inside. So it's definitely going to generate headlines for the size of the queue because they can't allow everybody in at the same time. But also just because like, that's such a cool thing to go and see the Cybertruck if I was local. I'd absolutely go and do that. Uh, this is going to definitely be a big PR win. For, not that they need any more PR around it, but it's very clever stuff. They're going to do really well out of all the attention over the next uh, week, is my prediction. So speaking of the Cybertruck, the the factory, the what are they going to call it? They're going to call it maybe the Terror Factory, Texas Terror Factory. Um, so there was a there was a couple of outlets who published stories yesterday saying that Tesla had purchased land in Austin, Texas, for the factory. It has not. Uh, Musk replied to a tweet about the story saying that uh, Tesla has an option to purchase this land, but has not exercised it. And later he responded to another tweet say, asking if Tesla was still in the mix. And he responded with, we are considering several options. But um, so Tech, TechCrunch reported that the, the, the application was filed by the Colorado River Project LLC. And I looked this, I'm looking up and it is indeed a, it's a new subsidiary of Tesla. It was a, uh, it was just got a charter date of like 5 2020. So like just the 20th of May, this, this, uh, I don't know, call it a shell company or a <laughs> proxy company showed up and they were using that to, to try to keep everything under wraps, you know, but anyway, but it, it got leaked out anyway through the controllers, Texas controllers office. 
And so the, they are reporting that Texas or Texas Tesla is trying to receive up to $68 million in a tax abatement over a 10 year period. That's part of their, you know, they want to get a good deal on this land and, and the operations there. So, and they have to do it through the, uh, the school, school board sort of area instead of like a county it's all it runs through the school board area and so, yeah so they're negotiating with them and they've made the application and just to apply for that they had to put down like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars so that was kind of interesting expensive application isn't it just to put uh, an application in i wonder what uh, i wonder what they get for their 150k you know this does suit uh this doesn't suit tesla rather to have any kind of confirmation that they're going to be in texas they're going to be in texas uh, because yeah. we know that elon uh, the, the, like their mo through everything they've done even from the original location in california is they like a beauty parade with different areas trying to attract them um, I've been convinced for ages that it's going to be Texas. There's no doubt in my mind that it will be. It just doesn't suit them to have uh, uh, other outlets running the story that it's a done deal because they're going to want the best possible deal from Texas. So uh, if it's not looking like there's any competitors in the ne negotiation, they'll get a worse deal. And, right. uh, and every, everywhere they've gone, they've managed to cut a spectacular deal, whether that's China or Berlin or now in Texas. They've uh, certainly... Like, but it's all big business does this, by the way. Right, right. I looked around in Oklahoma to see whether or not the uh, Colorado River Project had done anything there, or maybe if Tesla had another shell company or proxy company that uh, was trying to, you know, make the same kind of arrangement in the, uh, in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area, and I, I couldn't find anything. So I kind of think they're still, you know, very Texas focused. Um, so this application that also had a few other, there's a big document online you can download. It's like 50 some pages, I believe. And in, within that, if you read through, you can find out that the uh, Tesla will agree to build a four to five million square foot factory that would employ more than 5,000 workers. And uh, most of those people would be making less than 75 or $74,000, which is, I guess, pretty good. I don't know, for Austin. Um, and the location is southeast, southeast of Austin, off of Texas 130. And it's a collection of parcels of land and it makes up 2,100 acres, which is bigger than the Berlin Gigafactory site. So do you have any thoughts about this, Tom? Well, you know, I'm with Martin here. I think most of us have that same opinion that te Tesla's just trying to fine tune the deal now. I think for a long time, I, I, I believe that Tesla was going to end up in Texas for the Cybertruck. It just, it just seems like it's a perfect fit. And, uh, you know, they're just doing their due diligence and, and, and trying to squeeze out every last penny they can <laughs> from the taxpayers and get the best deal they can. Now, it doesn't mean that, that Tesla's a bad, uh, you know, partner in that regards. All companies do that. They play different states, different areas against each other to try to get the best deal. I think that's what they're doing. But when the dust settles, I think we're going to see cyber trucks, you know, rolling out of uh, Terra Factory in Tesla in uh, Texas for sure. Right. So just some all around the topic of electric pickup trucks, uh, the Ford F one fifty electric. Uh, we'll only see that in about two years from now, but the gas version will, of this new generation of Ford electric or Ford pickup F one fifty is going to be uncovered next week on the twenty fifth. So if you want to get an idea of what the electric version will look like just look at that next week and picture like a, a different grill maybe am i the only one uh let down by that being two years away or, or am i being greedy it seems like it's pushed back it seems like they're man i think i think that chevrolet might even beat them getting their pickup truck it just seems like two years like they've been talking about it for so long and then to then to revise it backwards just seems i don't know i'm, I'm let down by that but maybe that's what it takes to put an electric f-150 on the road I, I think your your mic is a little bit low, Martin. By the way, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm let I'm let down by that, but uh, maybe that's just what it takes. I don't know. Yeah, um, but on the same day as the F one fifty is being re uh, revealed, the uh, what's it? Lordstown vehicle is also going to be uh, shown. The Lordstown Endurance electric pickup truck. Yeah, will also make its debut debut on the twenty fifth. So that's going to be interesting. Try to get some audience. Uh, I think uh, the F-150 is going to suck a lot of oxygen up in the press. But, uh, you know, kudos to them if they can 
uh, get some traction with it because it's a decent looking vehicle. It's about 250 miles of range. It's got the in-wheel motors, a $52,000 truck. You have any thoughts on this, Kyle? Well, I'd love to get Tom's opinion, actually, because I think what we're seeing now is if you, if we, you know, for pretend that electric vehicles didn't exist. And basically in the U.S., you had the F-150, the Ram 1500 and the uh, Silverado. And then, of course, maybe like the Tundra somewhere in there and some other stuff. But there was pretty much no way you could start a new company and really compete on any scale with the big manufacturers. And what we're seeing now is Lordstown, Rivian, uh, potentially Nikola. Like you have all of these new startup companies that are coming into the pickup scene, and it's just going to change the entire game purely because of what powers the car. What's your opinion on this, Tom? Do you think this is a good thing, a bad thing? What, where's your head on this? Yeah, well, you know, there's a reason why no automobile company before Tesla, you know, there's been no new American automobile companies in the last hundred years. I think Chrysler was the last one in like 1928 to start and actually survive, um, you know, because it's incredibly hard to do. And I think what we're seeing is there's not a lot of, um, in the U.S., at least new car companies that are starting, but we're seeing all these pickup truck companies. Uh, company starting, um, you know, uh, Lordstown, Attilus, Bollinger, Nikola, you know, Rivian, um, you know, and they're trying to exploit the fact that, you know, we buy about 3 million pickup trucks a year here in the U.S. and not every company makes the, makes a pickup truck. So there's a little bit less competition. You've got these three companies that really control, well, maybe four if you want to put in Toyota, control the market. So if they the, the, if they could just get a little piece of that, that's a way for them to survive. So yeah, in, in that regards, it's not surprising that all these new companies are all making pickups. Now, they're not going to all make it. And, um, you know, the, the, the companies that get to market first with a with a big uh, with it with a decent product are going to be the ones that survive. Once Ford and GM, uh, and even Tesla with the Cybertruck and uh, Rivian, for instance, once these companies all have electric pickups on the market, it's going to be super hard for a, another small startup to come. Uh, you know, and I think that's why um, Lordstown is on such an aggressive timeline. I mean, they, they're going to show – we haven't even seen the production the, or, or a real working version of the truck. They're going to show it now, and then six, literally six months later, it's going to be in production. Uh, you know, that – I don't know how that works. You know, the ma manufacturers take years uh, to, 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 you know, engineer and, um, you know, validate vehicles. So, you know, I, I mean, I get what they're doing and I think that they have to be on an incredibly aggressive timeline. They have to get out ahead of everybody or that they'll just get swamped by the, by, by the, the, the big guys. But I, I'm just still trying to figure out how this works where, they're producing cars in January. <laughs> um, well, they may I, not I, be reliable cars, but they'll be producing <laughs> some kind well, of cars. <laughs> I, I hope it works. And I, ho I hope I that, just, you know, they've been doing so much behind the scenes and they're kind of, you know, um, keeping everything really close to the vest. And they've been beta testing trucks for months now. And, you know, or, you know, we, we, we hope that, that, that that's the case. So um, it's an interesting vehicle. We love the four wheel in hub motors, uh, it's got some great specs. It's got a good price. That's really important. The fifty-two thousand starting price isn't some astronomical figure. It's going to undercut what Rivian's coming to market with. Um, and but the, the the timing is super important. One of the things that I always go back to is if you guys remember Coda when Coda started. I mean, when they started making their car, no one was making electric cars. And if none of the OEMs decided they were going to make an electric car, Coda would have survived, even though it was a crappy car, because we would have had no options. But then, you know, to I, I remember towards- well, they were just so boring. I know, but Kyle, if there were no other options, <laughs> we would have survived. Them. The people that wanted electric cars would have bought them. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, Nissan, like out of nowhere, announced the Leaf. And it was like, all right, that's it. Coda's dead. You know, yeah. it's like- um, For the better. Yeah, you know, even if it was a good car, they were dead. Once once customers had an established brand that they trusted, 
uh, Coda wasn't going to make it. And I feel it's kind of the same way with these startups. Once there are electric vehicles from established brand electric trucks from established brands, it's going to be super hard for any of these startups to get any market share. So if if they have any chance, they've got to get to market now before there are established options. Yeah, Do you okay. think that there's a play to make an electric pickup truck to capture the minds of us Americans, you know, envisioning us driving an electric truck and then produce commercial vehicles out of them? Uh, because I think that might be a, you know, we spoke about this last podcast, just the huge underserved market of electric commercial vehicles. Um, do you envision any of these startups? We've already seen it with Rivian and Amazon vans. Uh, yeah. do, are we going to see more of this? That's what I was thinking of when you were talking about. It. I mean, we're already seeing it with Rivian, of course. I mean, that, that is such an enormous market. My, my, my partner owns an ice cream distributorship and he's got like 20 trucks. He's got 15 of like the Mercedes vans. And he keeps pinging me and saying, when, when can I get a, a, a reliable electric option that'll, that can serve my needs? You know, I'm all in, you know, he's got freezers that are blocks long. So he has all the electric supply he needs. He could just pop in the, a row of chargers and he knows the math. I've done the math with him and showed him how much money it'll save him fleet wise. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's as soon as these, the, these, uh, you know, uh, trucks, uh, the, 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 the frames, uh, frames, the, um, architecture is ready and can be transferred to commercial vehicles. Well, I think that's going to be an enormous market. He'll never visit a gas station again. Like if he's got a, a, a chunky electric supply already, then any business, then all they have to do is charge their cars when it's cheap and overnight. And, and all of a sudden, that's just a, a huge line with a big red through, like, no, red line through on their budget. It's it's going to take off. And I think you mentioned this last show or the or the, the show before, Tom. You know, these cars are bought with the head, not the heart. You know, whatever badge is on the front, as long as what's it going to cost me per month? What's total cost of ownership? And if it goes wrong, who's going to look after it? So it can't be from a complete, you know, uh, unknown company where there's it's going to cause issues if you break down it's a business you want to get back on the road in uh, in hours not weeks as long as that you can tick those boxes i don't care what badge is on the front absolutely the fleet managers the bean counters you know that, that, that that's all they get paid to do is reduce like you know when you've got fleets of dozens or even hundreds of vehicles if you could save a mile per gallon you know the, the, it's incredible and imagine you know a company that's got 30 or 40 van vans that are currently spending, you know, $200 a, a week in gas for each van, what their savings will be for electric, but it has to be able to serve their needs. The, if, if it, if it can't go as far as they need it to, if it can't perform the function it is, then the savings are, are useless. So, you know, once we get to the point where, and we're close, we're super close to that point now where we're going to have these long range commercial vehicles, it's, I mean, that's going to be, there's going to be a groundswell. So s sticking with the electric pickup truck uh, vibe, Nikola founder and chairman Trevor Milton this morning on Twitter announced that Nikola World 2020 or the Badger, Badger electric pickup truck will be unveiled and possibly a 500 watt hour per kilogram battery, which would be incredible if it's true. I haven't seen that mentioned recently, so maybe that's not as uh, a real thing who knows but anyway that'll be held in december now i thought it was going to be a lot earlier but yeah december 3rd and 4th he's got it over two days so apparently they have a lot to talk about you know over a two-day event so yeah that's been a pretty interesting thing to follow yeah so moving on away from pickup trucks to uh mass market sedans the volkswagen id4 has been leaked in China, fully uncovered. Tom, did you see this? Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's finally been leaked in China. Great. It's been leaked in Portugal and Germany and, and every other country in the world. Might right. as well be leaked in China. Um, how many of the spy photos have we seen of the ID4? And um, I got to love Volkswagen. They keep putting grills and badges on the on it from right. other manufacturers <laughs> right. it's hilarious it's like they're definitely punking us and i and i love that um you know it reminds me of i'm a big baseball fan when 
uh, a while back when the Mets manager, Bobby Valentine, got thrown out by an umpire. He went in the dugout and put on a mustache and came back. <laughs> he came back out onto the field with a mutt with this big black mustache. Mm. He got fined and everything, but like people loved him for it. The fans loved him. It was in all the newspapers. And I think Volkswagen's got a little bit of that going on with the ID4. Like they're not hiding the thing at all. They're not putting on the swirly paper no. wrap and all that stuff. They're just sticking on like like a Peugeot badge on the front and a we saw a Kia grill. It was the Kia front. Yeah. Like we don't like the fake exhausts, we don't mind. Car yeah. makers have been doing that for, for ages on electric cars. Like the fake exhaust is one thing, but painting on a or I think it did it with tape, taping on a Kia front was brilliant. Cause it's have you ever seen that, Martin, on any other no. manufacturer? I've never no. seen that. No, but, they all take it so seriously, and they've got the camouflage and yeah. the uh, and that. And so Volkswagen just put in a, a Kia front on it, like <laughs> they're fooling no one. But we all talk about it, so yeah. you know, smart move, brilliant, brilliant move. So yeah, <laughs> we we've seen it in China now, Dom, but we've seen it in like six different countries already. I think everybody knew what it, what it was going to look like, and uh, you well, know, have an idea. Them, wish them well for it, with it. <laughs> but this one in China, it doesn't have a fake front or it doesn't have any fake stickers on it. Like this oh, is this the actual the, vehicle. Um, to uh, no, I yeah, got this was like the, the regulatory filing that came out as well. Yeah. Uh, or they had to apply for something that meant it went into an, an official organization and there was no longer any way of, of, of not hiding it. It's nice we get to see the five different wheels there as well. And Well, they all look the same though, don't they? <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> five different wheels are the same yeah, thing. All the, same. <laughs> the five wheels, all the same. But you know, you those, choose, yeah, maybe this is like, one you two, like two wheels with different lighting. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to describe the differences between the two. They're the same colors, pretty much the same shape. This is for our non YouTube audience. <laughs> and, 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 they're literally identical. You could tell the one second from the left is like one inch bigger in diameter, yeah. Yeah. but that's it. It looks like it's just two different wheels. Yeah, yeah completely. It's a yeah. size yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so. brilliant. But yeah, but so the car that itself, was, looks, uh, the car itself looks pretty good though, right? It looks pretty good. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. this is, oh man, I, I, I tweeted about it this week saying that everybody who is in line, the first 30,000 people who got in line for the ID3, uh, should cancel their order and uh, wait for one of these because they're coming soon. And uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I was being flippant, obviously, and you know, it's Twitter, so I was uh, tongue in cheek, but uh, I kind of half meant it as well. Like, you know, it is a bigger size car than the Golf equivalent. So the ID3 is the Golf, and this is the Tiguan or Model Y equivalent. And so, yeah, it's a bigger car. And it's gonna be a more expensive car, but it's it's that crossover style. And it's actually, nice. It looks nice. It you know, it ticks the but it's. It's the right size. It's the right shape. It's it's gonna sell a bucket load of them. If if and, and well, they, obviously they will because if you're in the market for a car this expensive, you're probably gonna be eligible for the federal tax credit for the full amount, and so that's gonna really bring the price down to something that, as long as the range is good on it, they they should sell low and and they can make enough of them. They should sell a bucket load in in the U.S. Yeah, it's an awesome looking vehicle. I think it's gonna do. I think it's gonna do well. Depending, it all depends on prices. I think. But the the, uh, mm. the the numbers are pretty good as far as like range and charging and all, all those things. It's, it's just a matter of getting the price to reflect that sort of value. Right. And then also just the, de the huge depreciation uh, after you buy the car. It's sometimes not even the, the initial purchase price that deters owners, but it's the fact that they know it will take. Take iPace, for example, right? You can mm. buy them. Granted, you can buy them 20 grand off now but use their mid $40,000 right now for only 10,000 miles on them. Wow. So, and that, there's like go on cars.com. There's plenty of them. I'm sure my EV has them as well. So, right. you know, I would, uh, I, I really hope this car is priced appropriately and it's priced in a way will, where the price will not fall off a ledge because if it does, then the only people buying them will be on lease. And these, are, these will be made in China to start, but they are going to make them for, mm. like, in, I think Chattanooga, I believe, will we'll produce the American models at some point. It looks nice. That's mm -hmm. a nice car. Yeah, it looks good. It ticks. It's un, It's not exceptional, but it ticks every box. It's solid. Right. So speaking of uh, revealed Volkswagen uh, ID vehicles, the 
we also saw the reveal of a production version of the ID rooms, which we think might be the ID five or the ID six. This is like an early thing. It's not, it wasn't completely revealed. It looks like a shot in a factory and there's like some wrap across the front of it, but you just get an idea of the, of the feel of the size of it, I guess. So it's, a, it would be a, a little bigger than the four even. So like it's a step up to uh, maybe a midsize crossover. I don't know if you, if you cr cr classify the, the ID4 is a midsize or compact, but anyway, on, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the uh, the rooms or possibly ID5 or maybe ID6 there. Yeah, I'm surprised they put these pictures out because you know they're official pictures. You can see the banner at the top, which is the factory MEB platform offline ceremony. I'm not sure what an offline ceremony is, but um, maybe it's just they're driving off the line. Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm surprised that this is the ID5 when we don't hear too much about it, but. You know, they've they've wrapped they've wrapped the life out of the thing, so we can't really see what it looks like. I I wondered whether that was, I don't know. It's it's interesting to look at. It could be the ID five. Yeah, yeah. The front end definitely looks different from the ID four. So it looks yeah. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. So what else this week? Uh, the Ford Escape plug-in hybrid, the Fev. Um, its official EPA numbers were revealed. Gets 37 miles of EPA range. Tom, did you see this? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, it's it's not a surprise. Ford had been saying that that's where it was going to come in at. And, uh, you know, we talked about this, I think, in last week's show. Um, you know, it's good to see that the plug-in hybrids now are finally getting decent range, uh, all-electric range. Uh, right. the, you know, the average driver in the U.S. drives about 35 miles per day. So, you know, I, and, you know, I think that should be the, the bare minimum where you start at for a plug-in hybrid all-electric range. So the average person, you know, wouldn't, would be able to drive this vehicle and use no gas on a daily uh, commute or just daily driving cycle. Um, yeah, I think it's a great vehicle. We, 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 we did a lot of comparisons with it versus the Toyota RAV4 Prime because, I mean, they're just perfect competitors and both vehicles – um, I think have their advantages. Um, the, the, the Ford Escape is lower priced, so that's going to be available for a wider um, segment of the population. The RAV4 Prime has offers a little bit more with all-wheel drive. It's got a little bit further driving range. It's got uh, a lot more power. It's a lot more of a, of a powerful vehicle. It can tow a lot. Um, I'm not sure about the Ford's towing capability. I don't think that that's been published yet. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to serve a, a lot of people's needs. It's that, that right, the right size uh, class of a vehicle. And uh, like we said, there's still a lot of people that are not ready for a BEV. Uh, and uh, this plug-in hybrid is a great way to get them into an EV to see that, hey, this is not some kind of crazy, weird thing that I'm afraid of. Uh, drive it for a couple of years, and then possibly the next vehicle would be all electric. So, Kyle, you have the the non pluggable hybrid version of this vehicle already at your place now. So, uh, do you have a, have you had a chance to drive that much? Is it how's it feel? Yeah, I drove it up from home to the track yesterday, and then back here and just around town a little bit. The car itself is great. Like material usage is really nice. Uh, it's very spacious, pretty fast. Like I have no complaints about this car. Beautiful glass roof. Uh, I'm, it's actually quite impressing me, even down to little things like the key. I mean, this is Ford's nicer key, but like that's a nice looking key and it's heavy and it feels premium. And for a non-premium car, it's relatively premium. So I'm excited for the plug-in version. Uh, I was kind of hoping this would have the plug on it, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think they're going to sell tons of these things, especially as Martin said and Tom said, just price point wise, mm. it makes so much sense. Yeah, there's going to be loads of people that do want the four-wheel drive of the RAV4 Prime. You know, mm -hmm. there's going to be some cold areas that you know, that's a non-negotiable, and they want the all-wheel drive. But there's plenty of areas where you just want the the uh, is this front or rear-wheel drive? Front. But just front. Know, just the two-wheel drive, uh, you know, front-wheel drive of this uh, at a great price. And this is remind me eligible for the full tax credit. Believe it might be a little no, slightly less. It, it, oh, it's it, like it gets 5,500, 6,800. 6, okay, but still, it puts you. I imagine again, not having an inside knowledge of uh, of the kind of U.S. Uh, car prices, I imagine it puts it not far away from the normal hybrid version, probably like a couple of thousand dollars or what to get the plug and the battery. 
It's actually um, either matches or slightly oh. less expensive. Oh, buy than, this one. Get this one. Than the one in the same trim, the SE. I, I believe it. It. Uh, it. It. The uh, base version is the SE, not the lowest version that you can get the uh, the the escape in. So the SE versus the SE plug-in hybrid. I believe this actually is is slightly less. Is that oh, after either. after incentives or after pre -incentives? the incentives, Dom? Yeah. Okay. I mean, again, if you're in the market for a car that's expensive, it probably applies to you. So, mm -hmm. just get this. Get this one. It's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. You know what a great, uh, fantastic. Uh, although, huh, I did have a listener uh, not on our YouTube page, but email me separately to say, uh, why are you guys raving about plug-in hybrids when they do exactly the same range as a ten-year-old Volt? And I had no good comeback to that. Uh, maybe not. Maybe the second generation, like the 2013 Volt, was official, like 38 range or something. And it's like, well, they kind of had a point. You know, fast forward seven years, and we're complimenting cars for doing exactly what it did back then. So yeah, yeah but great. think about what BMW is doing right now, where every single one of their plug-in hybrids will have at least 100 kilometers of WLTP range. Mercedes, this doesn't come to the U.S., but I saw it in Frankfurt. Wild, they have a a plug-in mm. hybrid diesel with like a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack oh. with CCS fast charging. It's yeah. the GLE 350 DE. Now put that on the back of the car. Uh, that just <laughs> but that's a, that's a cool concept. It just sounds expensive. Yeah, the, the expense of the electric system and then diesel engines are more expensive than regular gas engines. And then it's a Mercedes project product. So yeah, yes. I want to Cheap see doesn't say. come to mind anywhere with that car. It is going to no. be quite hefty. But I just thought, like, I was just looking around, like, look at this GLE. It's nice CCS plug. What? Right. <laughs> yeah, great. Awesome. Uh, so I guess let's move along a little bit. Uh, Lucid Air uh, in production, guys, will be presented online on September 9th. So if you're looking for another, hopefully, super efficient, long-range EV sedan, uh, you know, the Lucid's going to bring it. And Tom, you're you're up to speed on the Lucid things. What's going on here? Yeah, so um, we actually have seen it already, even though this is like the formal uh, presentation. Uh, I, I think I might even take a little credit for this. Back uh, a about a month ago, Lucid tweeted out a picture of the Air um, within the announcement that they were going to make the vehicle available in the UAE. Um, and I looked at the tweet and I, I quickly pulled up their concept pictures and kind of compared them and noticed that that was not their concept vehicle that they took, a, that they posted in their tweet. And uh, after uh, studying it for a little bit, I, I, I reached out to Lucid and, and kind of asked them, hey, you know, what's up with this? There, I see the uh, ADAS uh, section in the front bumper. That wasn't on the concept. The rear view mirrors are different. And um, I kind of got, well, you know, we're not supposed to say this, but that might be the production vehicle. <laughs> so so we, we wrote an uh, article up on, on Inside EVs about it. Yeah, that's it right there. That, that, that's it. That's the production air. And um, so, you know, we've kind of seen it, but we'll get to see the whole, uh, you know, uh, the whole thing in September. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, I've, I've always liked the lucid air I, I i've i've sat in a vehicle i've ridden it it's 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 a really really cool car and um you know i'm i'm, I'm hoping that uh you know they, they they make it i know the coronavirus uh, shutdown has really hurt some of the 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 startups you know the maybe the less secure startups i mean you look at the the faraday and lucid and bite to an extent um, it's really, really punished these companies that were kind of just, just kind of getting along as it was. Um, so I, I, I hope that uh, they're all able to bounce back from this. I know that Lucid was really looking forward to their New York City debut of the air uh, at the New York Auto Show. I had um, set up a bunch of uh, meetings with them, and uh, you know, we I, I was looking forward to getting some exclusive time with the car. And, uh, you know, that when that was all canceled, they were just kind of like, oh, now what do we do? You know, this was their huge coming out party. And, uh, you know, I, I actually felt bad for them. Uh, so now they're doing it this way. And uh, hopefully they're not going to be delayed too much. Looks like they're going to be ready to start producing vehicles by year's end out in uh, Casa Grande, Arizona. The factory is uh, phase one, I think, is going to be complete 
in uh, four or five months. And uh, at that point, they can start producing cars. I don't know what rate, but, um, you know, that, so they're not too far behind their original plans. We need to get some drones out there at the factory site to see how that's progressing. Actually, we could probably arrange that. You're allowed to fly drones around there, and a good yeah. friend of mine lives nearby and is a drone pilot. So we I've might, seen- uh, we should maybe have him do a little thing for the Inside EV's YouTube channel. That would be cool because we see so many over the, the, anything Tesla does <laughs> that you know if you if you fly slightly below the the radar, pardon the pun there, with drone flying. But if you are Lordstown or Lucid, and you know you haven't got a uh, a company boss who is uh, uh, venting their fury on Twitter, uh, mentioning no names. Uh, you are, uh, you, you know, I think you're you're really onto a winner here because Lucid as well. I, I was off my radar until you guys told me recently about all. Oh, it's got to be on the radar. Efficiency, yes. the technology, but very quietly, very competently, just getting on with it. And, and that makes me majorly excited for this car. I mean, it just looks stunning. And if it could... Well, here's- Sorry, here's the thing everyone forgets. Peter Rawlinson, who runs the company, is engineered the Model S, right? He is there. Pretty much everyone else there is ex-Tesla. They know their stuff. Peter Hock Holdinger runs their factory and all of their production. He basically came in when Model 3 had all the problems, fixed everything up, and got it going. So they know what they're doing. He was also responsible for Audi Q5 and I think Q7, but had the highest quality production out of any automobile factory in Germany under him like that, you know, they're building some really high quality stuff. So I think they have the right team. The product's insane. Tom, like you had mentioned, spent a lot of time with it. I was able to spend a lot of time with it and the team and it's just awesome. And um, I'm really excited for this launch. It's no one's thinking about it, but it's going to take everyone by storm just when they see the specs. Well, I hope so. That's that's the thing with Lucid. They they haven't, they've got a lot of, you know, things nailed down. All right. But they haven't really captured the public's imagination. I mean, there's nothing. It's an okay style. It's a little different than what we're used to, but it it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not bringing the house down. There's not, or, you know. Not right. Well, to... I think if they 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 can hone their technology with the air, and then I think they have seven models planned, and I think that's where we're going to start to see maybe their expansion because the air in general, I mean, if you look at the market for executive sedans, it's not that big in right. the U.S. No. You know, we've all moved to SUVs, but I think it's smart for them to start here, start small in a manageable size and fleet, sure. and then bring on a new model relatively quickly thereafter that will capture more people's imagination. And this does have some good specs in it. And speaking of specs, actually, I skipped this earlier. We don't want to talk about the Tesla Model S has uh, finally achieved a 400 mile EPA range. Now, this is the same 100 kilowatt hour pack that they've had for, since uh, early, I guess, late in two, 2016. The Performance 100D came out, and then the 100, the regular 100D came out in uh, 2017. And at that time. It was rated for 335 miles, and so the same pack, the size of the pack, has is got an extra 20 percent of range, so 67 more miles. That's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, you saw this news, right, Martin? I, I did, but Tom wrote the story for us, so I, you know, I think I should defer to him first, and <laughs> sure. I, I can I can come back and, and offer some um, wayward opinions at the end of it. That's right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I mean the basic gist of the ar- of the article I think was that there was no way Elon was going to let another car company come out with an EPA range rating of 400 miles before he did. And it appears as though Lucid is going to um, have a 400 mile EPA range rating. So, you know, the 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 orders were in, get me a 400 mile <laughs> range rating. And you got to love that Tesla just keeps improving their product. You know, it, it's you know, who else is doing that? You know, and it's it's kind of, you know, part of the allure of Tesla and why, you know, they suck so much of the oxygen out of the room. You're talking about why did, doesn't, why isn't anybody paying attention to Lucid? Well, it's because of ha- what Tesla's doing and how they're just, they constantly, you know, revise their vehicles, make them better. They're always in the news. I guess it doesn't hurt that you've got a CEO that, you know, is, well, is, just is, is, in the is space a Twitter and maniac, you know, <laughs> that, that, that gets uh, even more attention. But, you know, the, the, the fact that 
They wouldn't give up until they got this 400 mile range rating. They, they, they tried earlier in the year and I think the EPA came back and said, no, we're going to only certify it at 391. And that's when Elon said he pulled the logs and they had left the key in the car overnight. And that, that made it lose, you know, about 10 miles of range. And the, the EPA came back and said, no, nah, we didn't do that. You know, and Elon said, yes, you did. We have the logs and you're lying. And now all of a sudden, somehow it's rated at 402 miles. And I don't think Tesla made any changes to the car. So it, it kind of lends to the argument that Tesla was right, that the EPA did something wrong when they, when they, when they rated it last time to, to, and, and it actually sucked some of the energy out overnight. Cause that's what the, the, when the, when the EPA checks the cars, the way they do is they fully charge the car up and then they let it sit overnight and then they begin the range testing in the morning. So um, if the if a key was left in the car, if some of the systems were active that shouldn't normally be active overnight, it could easily, you know, use that much energy to, to make it lose, in this case, uh, you know, 11 miles of, mm -hmm. of range. So. It appears that's what happened because I don't think they made any other changes since that last range rating. Right, and this this affects cars that were built since January. And if if you scroll down the article too, you can see the, the different systems that they've improved or and things they've changed to achieve that range because they're always making small changes or big changes. Yeah, and so, like, so here they mass, mass reduction, new wheels, yeah. right? New it's the drive. Raven with the aero wheels, basically. So the Tempest, the Tempest wheels. There you go. <laughs> Tempest uh, error wheels. And they, they mentioned regen and, and, and supercharging. That won't. That but it was also that. interesting some of the uh, some of the things they learned manufacturing the Model 3 and Model Y, that some of the weight savings they, they made there, they've also somehow applied to the uh, Model S and I think they said X as well. But mm. so they didn't really get into details about that. So I, now I really kind of want to see uh, someone like Sandy, Mon some Sandy Monroe tear down a, a new Model S to see what's going on because they've made changes to that chassis since they began i just i remember um, i think it was like in 2013 or 14 hearing that uh, they had taken 200 pounds out of the car somehow but they hadn't there was no press about it they hadn't gone public with it anything it, uh, one of the pr people kind of slipped that to me at one point well i've so, forgotten about the smallest battery because i i was thinking about the 60 kilowatt hour which was epa rated for something like 210 215 Right. Yeah, I think it was back, 216 EPA, 60. Right, back in the D. day. So, and that was at a 60 kilowatt hour pack. And uh, that uh, I'd forgotten uh, about the 40 that no one bought. But yes. you know, they did They did make some low range cars. Uh, and, uh, but so to counter the criticism that I get sometimes on my podcast of, oh, you talk about Tesla too much. Yes, I agree, partially. But also they've taken a car, what, what was that, 2014? 2015 car, the 60 kilowatt hour, and now effectively their their cars you can buy that car that did 200 miles, and now with a admittedly a bigger battery, but not a double sized battery, doing double the mileage. It's just seriously impressive engineering. Well, you've never seen anything like this from a traditional automaker, right? It's seven years new car ground up. And then we just roll with that. And maybe you do a life cycle impulse LCI is what BMW calls it, like a refresh, you know, three or four years into that model line. Right. Um, but what, you know, I'm just excited for a real legit battery pack in Model S now. You know, we're, we're working with 2015, 16 technology in this S. It still cannot take advantage of the superchargers 250 kilowatt full maximum speed of charging although i will say 90 kilowatt hour packs are doing like 180 kilowatts uh, we've seen close to maybe 200 on the 100 packs so they're definitely improving the older charging logic but you still can't take full advantage of your best tech and a model 3 can that to me that's just a huge gap i can't wait to get new battery tech in model s and just watch it just blow everyone out of the water i hope yeah, the cells are different and the uh the architecture of the pack is a little different from the s and x to the three and the y so there's some yeah. gains well, that they need it. that they've made in, the, in those new cars that they need to apply to the older vehicles but it does, i don't think they're going to do that they're going to you know the model s and x are just going to go away at some point and be replaced hopefully be replaced with a new product which mm. will be you know I think it'll be as a big a step change as the the three was from the S. You know, this will be again like 
Yeah, yeah. The next, I, I, whatever the comes next, expect it to be pretty great. We saw the news this week that Tesla and Panasonic signing a new three-year agreement, which you know includes investment in Gigafactory from Panasonic, because that footprint right. has stayed the same for a long time, but also uh, a, an agreement of how many cells Tesla would buy. And and that was always the case of when on the uh, on the earnings calls, occasionally someone who didn't, you know, was sort of maybe uh, less informed would say to Elon, you got the, you know, the, the, the new form factor 2170s in the three and the Y, why are you still using these these eighteen six fifties in the S and the X and 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 he'd kind of take a deep breath and and tell this person well because we have a contract to buy them from Panasonic and we a we're good at making them but also there uh, we we can't just say oh we want the new stuff now because we have those agreements and I saw the news this week that wasn't specific on uh, any kind of particular cells but I did wonder oh, I wonder if that this new agreement then phases out older technology. And then they move towards new. We didn't get too many details on that, but uh, it, it would make sense if that was. The older cells are made exclusively in Japan. So this agreement only covered the this agreement only covered the, this agreement only covered the Gigafactory situation. As far as I could tell, I didn't see anything about you know long term commitments to buy cells of, of the older variety. Mm, yeah, so maybe the S and the X with that new battery pack, which is uh, you know definitely not happening according to Elon, but it is. Uh, they're finally going to get cells uh, made slightly closer to home. We don't know, but that would be nice. All right, we'll find out more on Battery Day when when that happens, which is well, which is whenever, even though right. it's virtual, so it could happen at any time. Right, it might just happen now. We could just get a notification: Tesla's live. <laughs> when, did, uh, when did Nickel World say it was going to happen? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. When they finish demanding that journalists get fired, I imagine. Yes. Oh, gosh. Can we, we probably shouldn't talk about this. Okay, moving, about on. It, moving on. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about it. It's, no, it's, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. It's, it's fine. A, you know, it's a, you, know you, can, you can check out uh, Trevor Milton's. No one uh, will ever want to do an interview with Nicola ever again. Uh, no, 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 no journalist ever wants to uh, open that door again. <laughs> Right. So uh, we want to wrap up here pretty quick. So let's just hit a couple stories real quick. Um, Lyft, you know who Lyft is, I guess, the, the Uber alternative, uh, has said they will switch to 100% electric cars by 2030, which, excited? Is that great? I don't know. I'm disappointed. I think that's not especially ambitious, and I didn't see any news about how they're going to help people, the drivers, make that switch themselves that's the big thing. How are you going to convince a crowdsourced driver using their own car to buy and use an electric car? You could just knock them off your platform if they're not driving EVs. They're piloting a really cool program in Denver, which is you sign up, you get a Kira, a Kira, a Kia Nero EV that you rent essentially, but it comes with free unlimited charging at Electrify America as a Lyft driver. And uh, you just drive it like it's your own and return it back to the lot when you're done. And they said it's been hugely popular. And if you look at like any plug share picture at the Denver Electrify America sites, it's just all Kia, those things. It's all Kia Nero's just plugged in charging. I thought that was a great idea. So maybe Lyft is just going to say, if you want to be a driver, you have to use our cars. And it's more, it's like the old taxi business now again. <laughs> that's how you know taxi fleets would run you know you, my dad was in the taxi business so he would hire you know he had like four or five cars and he would hire you know drivers to, to drive them keep them going 24 hours if, if possible and they would make it like a 60 40 split you know we pay the gas and they get 40 percent of their take so this is like a kind of similar situation you know you you're paying your monthly or weekly fee for the car and you're just picking it up and driving it but it's it's not really your car, but you're making money with it. So, so I have a question. Will there be drivers in 2030 in Lyft cars? Yes. But will we, do you think we will have begun to do driverless uh, car sharing services in certain areas? Uh, just about starting. Yeah. But I, I, I really think it's going to take a little bit longer than what everyone's saying uh, right. to get this driverless stuff going and implemented. Um, but I do think for most of these uh, driverless alternatives, you know, if we have autonomous vehicles, they will be electric for ride sharing services. But once that happens, and once it goes on a large scale, to your point, Tom, you know, it's just that's that 
it would not make sense to have a human in that car spending their day driving around at that point. There's no need. I mean, if you, if you're a customer and you want a car, you don't want to necessarily deal with the driver if you don't need to deal with the driver and you don't have to, you don't have to worry about tipping. You don't have to worry about awkward conversations or anything, you know, like strange. You can just have a car show up and jump in, you know, I I think, think I think by 2030, we will absolutely have areas where this, where driverless car sharing is in service. Uh, I, I certainly don't expect it to be everywhere, but I, I think somewhere around the 2027, 2028 is when we're going to start to see small pilot programs. And by the early 2030s, I think w- w- that it's going to be expanding across, you know, many areas of the world. Well, I could see that. But I don't see them removing my Tesla steering wheel and letting that thing go and drive people around. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me be the naive optimist and say 2025. I think that's what Mary Barra was saying the other day. Even though the company that they, uh, uh, who they have in, in San Francisco, they have a you know a ride sharing company and they're going to be producing cars for it. But they said when that vehicle launched uh, last fall, that by the time it's produced, which is like I think the end of next year, that it'll be able to do their self-driving at least at least in the san francisco area because they have that really well mapped well the problem that i see with these uh companies that are taking a one city approach is uh if you look at waymo for example i think they're doing a pretty good job where they're testing in one market but they plan to launch in multiple markets so they can just capture everything right if you're just doing san francisco there's no exclusivity agreement waymo can just step in and do it there too and because they'll have the scale they can do it cheaper so i think that i forget the name of that uh company in san francisco but um alex roy has some really good takes on this uh if you listen to the autonicast and it's all about how deploying these types of autonomous ride sharing services are totally going to affect everyone and this one city approach is just not the answer that's it's cruise this is the name of the company yes cruise yes yeah i don't I, man i need to go over the materials i didn't realize we we're going to be talking about it today because I, I was thinking they had a a pretty good approach to coming to market, but yeah, I need to re- go over that again and just see what their plans are. So uh, to, before we go, I just want to hit really quick on the Polestar has opened production for orders of its uh, Polestar 2. You can you configure, didn't you, Carl? Oh yeah, I yeah, I want mine in that nice gray color with with uh, with the performance package, gold seat belts, and the the big Olin suspension and brakes, and oh, I'm so excited! If only that car did not slope down in the back and I could fit my dogs inside, I would seriously order it right now. That's a fastback, not a station wagon, I guess. Yeah, it's beautiful. Right, I want a Polestar wagon. Basically, I want a Volvo V60 electric with all the fast stuff right. on it. Yeah. So, so did you do the actual configuration? Yes, I did. I think it was 65000 which is basically what I paid for my Model 3. And it's a way nicer car, in my opinion. I mean, granted, you lose some of the tech out of the Tesla and stuff like that. But it's a nicer place to be, if you ask me. I think it's a very competitive price for a performance car. So I, I went through all the steps. And you, actually, if you go to the Inside EVs forum, uh, to the Polestar section and the Polestar 2 subsection. I've got a thread where I, I walk through all the different steps. If you're curious about how that works, you know, mm. uh, you s- jump on and you plug in your location and it pulls up the stores and you can choose one of those stores. Um, yeah, it's basically you- New York or San Francisco, right? New York, San basically, Francisco, yeah. LA. I think there was two on the West Coast, one on the East. That's right. Uh, and there's, well, three on the West Coast. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, well, there's two in the San Francisco area, Marin and uh, another area. Uh, so, yeah, you can go in and choose your colors. I chose Moon. I'm not actually ordering the car because, yeah, I have a car. Um, I might keep up to like a lot more than that because I, I chose the big fancy wheels with uh, and had to play the performance package to get that i think it was like seventy three thousand something or i other. could have been looking at the post tax credit number and not have realized it because i it definitely started with a six and i'm pretty sure i start i checked everything that i that i thought i would want which was everything 
Did, did you choose the big wheels and get the performance package? Oh yeah, I gotta have that because it comes right. with gold seat belts. What's cooler than gold seat belts in your you car? Gold seat belts. Yeah, have gold gotta seat belts. have gold. It was. I did a but review on the Volvo V60 plug-in hybrid Polestar thing, and that was the highlight. It has gold seat belts. That's just the it has, has a gold matching gold uh, Brembo brake calipers as well. So did yes. you order also the? Um, you got floor mats, I guess. You have to, I don't. That was really strange, you know, having to order floor mats like as an I option. I didn't do order. any of the accessories. I, oh, no. oh, okay. So I, I don't know. I apologize on behalf of Europe for making you buy floor mats. I'm very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and for having to buy rear windshield wipers and everything else on yeah, your cars. Yeah. Out, yeah. We 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 spec a lot of stuff that you would look at and think that just should come with the car. So I, I I ordered the tow bar too. I threw that up because it, it had it's some weird. Right, thing. I did as well because it flips down electronically. I thought yeah, that was right. really nice. You can't yeah, see I thought it. That was discreet. Kind of... And all the Nordic countries will have. They've got a tow anyway. Norway, etc. So uh, it'll they'll be shipping nearly all of them with tow bars over here. I'm just yeah. so pumped about this. This is going to be such a great product. And every time you see one on the road, you know, it's just going to be like that guy bought the cool one, not the one that you buy with, you know, your numbers. It's not the bean counter car. It's the emotional decision car. Right. So, hey, so Kyle, come over to the uh, Inside EVs forum man, and let us know about your your car at the Polestar 2 section. Because I'd like, in, or if anybody else out there has uh, has ordered one, we would really love to hear, get your feedback and, and hear about your experience going through this whole process, buying process. Right. I'd be curious to see what people who have actually ordered the car think. I just spec'd mine out, but I didn't uh, click the order button uh, because I can't fit the dogs in there. But if it if uh, if it was a you know a straight roof all the way back, that's what I would be driving. Gotcha. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. It's been great. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom is at Tomalog. Martin is at EV News Daily. And Kyle is that out of spec. I'm Dominic underscore Y. So click and subscribe and tap that bell notification or bell icon for notifications. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a great weekend.